this video, we're going to show you how to get your Raspberry Pi board set up for lab and development work. The very first thing we're going to want to do is download an operating system and flash it onto an SD card so that we can boot it later on from the Pi. And once we boot it, we'll have a full desktop environment to do our work in. You'll be able to find this operating system image uh, from raspberrypi.org. And then uh, you'll click on Downloads. And you're going to want to install the uh, Noobs version of the operating system. This is just a... Uh, the Raspbian Linux operating system, which is based on Debian Linux, which is just a flavor of uh, Linux, and it has a really convenient installer built in. So we're going to want to start with the offline and network install. You'll want to download the zip file or the torrent if that's what you prefer. Um, but we'll just go ahead and download the zip file. And uh, it's about a gigabyte, so when it's done, we will um, just extract all the contents over to our SD card. Once you've downloaded the noobs image, you'll have a zip file, and all you need to do is go into the zip file and copy all of the contents over to your SD card. So here I have my SD card in uh, partition F. So all I need to do over here is drag all of these over to the SD card and then let that write. You don't have to format the SD card. Um, it's not necessary if you're using noobs. Um, you just let all these uh, files copy over and then you'll be ready to go and ready to boot the image. Once your SD card is flashed, you can go ahead and put it in the board. Over here on the bottom side, this is the SD card connector, and you want to insert the chip with the uh, pins facing toward the green board, like this. So you push it in, there is no spring, it'll just stop. You just want to make sure it's flushed with the side uh, and that it's uh, pushed in all the way. So on the other side, we we'll go ahead and plug in HDMI. This is to our monitor. Then you can go ahead and put in the uh, USB and keyboard, uh, the USB keyboard and mouse cables over here on the USB sockets on the side. And then you can apply power. Immediately when you apply power, the board is going to boot up. And when it boots, when it's powered, you'll see this uh, red LED come on. Give it a few seconds and then you'll see some console messages being printed off. And then you'll be greeted to this menu. This is the menu for the Noobs installation system. So Noobs is really just a, a very convenient installer for the uh, Raspbian operating system that we're going to be using. Raspbian is a flavor of uh, Linux. It's actually based on a distribution called Debian Linux that you'll learn about later. Uh, but anyway, we're going to install Raspbian. So with our mouse and keyboard attached, we'll just click on uh, the Raspbian option here. And then we'll go down here and set our language to English and then our keyboard to US. It's very important that you do that, otherwise when you enter certain keys in there, you'll get symbols that aren't found on the uh, US keyboard, which is probably what you're going to be using. With all those options selected, we'll click Install, and it's saying it's gonna overwrite the card, that's fine. And then we will wait here where we basically uh, wait for the installer to complete. It's copying all the files to the hard drive and setting this, or to the SD card, and setting the system up to boot into the full uh, Raspbian operating system image the next time you boot. So it'll take uh, five to 10 minutes. So we'll fast forward through this. Once the installation is done, you'll see a, a success message like this. So you'll just hit OK, and the board will automatically reboot. And when it reboots, it will boot in the Raspbian operating system that we just installed. Up in the right-hand corner, the top right, you can click on your, uh, select your wireless networks here and connect to Wi-Fi. Or if you're connected through Ethernet, uh, that should appear as well. You have a full web browser over here in the top left. It operates just like any other web browser. Uh, you have a start button over here which has all of your uh, applications that are going to be installed on the system. Uh, but everything else that we're going to do from this point forward is going to be done in the Linux terminal. So the Linux terminal can be accessed by clicking up here on this icon. Or alternatively, you can hit Control-Alt-T and that will also bring up a terminal. From the Linux console, we can finish setting up our system. The first thing I'm going to want to do is run Raspi Config, which is a utility that comes on the Raspbian operating system that allows us to set the time zones, the locale, and other hardware options for the actual Raspberry Pi board. To run Raspi Config, we just type raspi-config, and then we run. Now, if you run it like this, you're going to get an error, and it says something about the script must be run as root. What that means is that you need administrator privileges or root privileges to actually run this. Uh, it's similar to if you're on Windows where you have to right click on an executable and select run as administrator in order to run something with uh, necessary permissions. In Linux, sudo is the tool that we use to run things as root. So all you have to do is type sudo before the command you want to run. 
So in order for us to run raspy config as a, a root account or as an administrator, we just type in sudo raspy config, then that should bring us to our script. Now the raspy config uh, presents you with this menu in the console. And the very first thing we're gonna wanna do is go to inter internationalization options. We're gonna do this to set our locale. So the locale basically sets uh, regional settings for the actual board, like the language and the character set and all that kind of stuff. By default, the Raspberry Pi actually has the uh, British locale installed on it. So we wanna put American English on here because chances are that's the type of uh, locale that you're in, the type of character set that you're using and all that. So when you go to uh, the locale setting, you'll have all these options. These are all different country and language settings. So we wanna go down to English, so it'll be EN. And then notice there's an asterisk by GB for Great Britain. So that's Great Britain, Great Britain English locale. It's actually slightly different than uh, English US. So we wanna go to EN, US, and we wanna select UTF-8. So we go down to the setting, uh, we hit the space bar to uh, select that setting, and then we hit tab to go to OK, and then enter. Now here, uh, this shows the locales that are installed on the system. So we have the original um, Great Britain English, and we have the um, United States English settings that we just uh, installed on there. But this is where we actually need to select the one that's going to be used system-wide. So we want to go down to English US UTF-8, um, hit enter, and then that will set our locale to uh, English US. So you can see here it's generating those locales. We still have the uh, Great Britain, the UK one installed, um, but the US one is going to be actively selected on our system. Uh, the next thing we want to do is go back to inter internationalization options, and we want to set our time zone. Um, we're in central time zone, so we go to US, and then we go down to central, and then our time zone should be set. Now, there's a bunch of other options here. If you want to use the Raspberry Pi camera, you can enable that hardware subsystem. Um, you can do overclocking, you can do a bunch of other stuff. Uh, but to, for the initial setup, all we need to do is set the locale and the um, time zone. So once we're done with that, we'll hit finish. And then our Raspberry Pi is pretty much set up. One additional step we're going to take is update our system clock using Network Time Protocol, or NTP. NTP is a Linux component that allows you to update your system clock with servers that are found online. Now it's important that we do this because we're eventually going to be using Git to check out code. And Git, the underlying protocol, requires that your clock is synchronized with Git's servers, which are also synchronized with NTP. So by default, uh, if you don't have NTP installed or you're not using it and your clock is out of date, that's okay, your system is going to run, but you may have some problems when you use certain web services, such as Git, SSL, HTTPS, uh, etc. So in order to update our time using NTP, we're going to install a program called NTP Date. NTP Date is just a little utility that actually does the synchronization. So in order to install that, we need to run sudo, and we're going to do app git install NTP Date. So we'll run this command, and then that will find uh, the NTP date package, and it'll go ahead and install it for us. And then once it's installed, we'll be able to run it. So now NTP date is installed. Now before we run NTP date, we need to stop a background service that runs on our Raspberry Pi or any Linux machine, and that's the NTP service itself. So NTP is the background network time protocol service that actually does all the uh, management of the clock. So we need to stop that, update our NTP time, and then retake restart the NTP service. So to stop the NTP service, we'll do sudo service NTP stop. And this will actually stop the NTP service. So I ran sudo because I needed to run it as administrator. Service is the command uh, built into Linux that allows me to access background services. And then NTP and stop are arguments that I'm passing to the service uh, executable that I'm running with sudo. So it's basically saying run the service command with administrator privileges and pass NTP and the command stop to that service command that I'm running. So basically it's just saying stop the NTP service. So once I do this, then I can uh, go ahead and update the NTP time. So I'll do sudo NTP date, and then I have to give it a server to access. So um, this is gonna be some web URL uh, that it'll go to to actually synchronize the clock. A very common one that a lot of people use is pool.ntp.org. So I give it that, uh, that address and it should go ahead and synchronize the clock. Now it's very possible if you're on, say, a university or a corporate network, and, and you can see here that it updated the time correctly. 
But it's very possible that if you're on a university or corporate network, that they block out access to external NTP servers. This is because NTP, if it's wide open, it can actually be a vector for denial of service attacks. There's a lot of uh, literature and resources and stuff that you can read about that. So in that situation, anybody that blocks out or any large uh, corporate network that blocks out NTP traffic will give you an alternative server to use. In the case of UTA, um, University of Texas at Arlington, rather than giving pool.ntp.org, you can do sudo ntp date uh, time.uta.edu, and that'll have the exact same effect. Now you can't access time.uta.edu from outside of the UTA um, domain. So in other words, if you're not on a local network there, you're, you're not gonna be able to use it. So where I'm running it here, I'm actually not on campus, um, that's probably going to give me an error. Let's see. Yeah, so no, no server suitable for synchronization. That just means that you can't reach that server. If I was on campus right now and I ran sudo ntp date pull.ntp.org, I would see this error message when I ran that command. But if I ran this command, sudo ntp date time.uta.edu, while on the campus network, it would succeed. So just be sure that you keep that in mind when you do this on your board, depending on where your location is. And then finally, um, once that's run, then we need to restart the NTP service. So I do sudo service NTP start. That will restart the background NTP service, and now my clock should be all synchronized. So I can run the date command to verify that the time looks correct, and that does in fact look correct, and now our clock is synchronized. Now that our system is all set up, we're ready to go ahead and check out some code from an online repository. We're gonna be using the Git protocol to check out code that's hosted on GitHub. So the very first thing we wanna do is install Git, and we're actually gonna install a couple other utilities as well. So um, we need something called CMake to help compile our code, and we also need a program called gedit that we're gonna to use to look at that code and uh, make changes, so a simple text editor. So we need Git, CMake, and gedit, and we can install all three of those components with one line using app git. So sudo app git install, and we want git, cmake, and gedit. When I run this command, it'll find all three of those components, and I can hit yes to install them. So this will work to uh, install all those. Once git is installed, we're ready to clone our repository, uh, check out some files, and then compile that code. So git is just a um, source repository tool that allows us to maintain a repository somewhere remotely, uh, basically up in the cloud, and uh, store the changes for that code, uh, store revision history, make comments, share code, et cetera. Um, so it keeps our code nice and safe, uh, backed up somewhere remotely, um, and it's a lot more secure and a lot more convenient than just basically uh, keeping all the files stored on your local hard drive and saving different versions and all that kind of stuff. Um, so Git is used from anywhere from uh, single developer small projects all the way up to enterprise level software and large open source projects with hundreds and maybe even thousands of developers. There are other uh, source code repositories available. SVN is a, another popular one. Um, Git recently has become pretty popular because of GitHub. Uh, GitHub is an online service, um, a cloud service that runs Git under the hood. It uses the Git protocol to manage code and check in code. Um, and it's a pretty popular tool that's used by a lot of uh, very large open source projects. There's also Bitbucket and uh, several others, um, but our class code is hosted on GitHub. So to check out our repository, we're just going to do git clone, and then we're going to enter the URL to our repository. So it's uh, github.com slash cmro slash csc2100. And we enter that command, and then that checked out our repository. There's not a lot of files in there, so it uh, transferred pretty much immediately, um, but everything was successful. So if I do the ls command, that will list all of the files and folders that are in my current directory. So I'm in the home directory, and when I typed ls, that shows all the folders that we have. Those are going to show up in purple. So you can see I have a new CSE2100 folder, so I'll change directory, or cd, to that location. Um, and then now I'm in that folder. I'll ls here to list all the contents of this folder. And you can see I have a hello world folder and I have a readme.md. So hello world is a project that we're going to compile and run. Um, so I'm going to CD into that hello world folder and then I'll LS again. And then these are the, the contents of that folder. So I have a cmakelist.txt, hello world.cpp and notes.txt. So we want to compile hello world. Uh, but the problem is that we don't have a solution file or a make file in here to actually do that compilation. 
So when you're on Linux, um, when you compile code, you need something called a make file. A make file is just a file that tells the compiler which, uh, which source files are part of the compilation, what executable name it should be compiled to, what libraries it should link to, and all that kind of stuff. Now that can actually be pretty cumbersome to set up, and it actually is similar in Windows. In Windows, if you're using Visual Studio, you have solution files and project files. So solution files are these containers that store your code, um, the link directories, the include directories, all the settings and all that kind of stuff. And normally you would go and manually create that. So you click on new project in Visual Studio and you'd add all the, um, go through all the menus and it would take a while to set it up. CMake is a tool that allows us to automatically generate those configurations. So CMake is not a compiler, but it's a build file generator. And when the build file is created and build files are gonna be make files or solution files in Visual Studio, it'll generate either of those two build files and then we can directly compile that code on whatever system that we're on. So it also makes it very easy for us to share code and run it across multiple systems. So let's say that uh, we're developing here on a Raspberry Pi in Linux, but we're just developing generic C++ code. And then maybe someone we're uh, developing with is running Mac or Windows with a Visual Studio or Homebrew. They could use CMake to generate their build files, which would look very different than your build files. But at the end, you would be able to compile and run the exact same code on your different systems. So we'll talk more about CMake later on, um, but for now, we're just gonna go through the process of using it to generate a make file that will then compile. So this cmakelist.txt file contains um, all the information that we need to generate those build files. So all we need to do is cmake and then dot. Now the dot command is a Linux command or a Linux um, a keyword, if you wanna call it that. That basically just means the current directory that I'm in. So basically what I'm saying is that I wanna run cmake and rather than giving it a large path to some files, I can just say dot so it's gonna run the CMake command and it's gonna look in my current directory for a CMakeList.txt and it's gonna use that as input. So when I run this, CMake will be invoked and then it's gonna generate the uh, build files. And now it says uh, build files have been written to um, the directory that we're in. So when I run LS, I, said I should see some make files in here. Um, so notice over toward the right, I have a make file. Um, the make file is what my compiler, and in this case it's a GCC or G++, um, that's what it's going to look for when it actually starts to compile my code. There's also a bunch of other stuff that CMake generated. There's a CMake cache.txt, CMake files, um, and all that. That's just um, cache data for the uh, project that we've developed, so we don't need to worry about it right now. But once the make file is generated, we can go ahead and compile the code with the make command. This will automatically in invoke the GCC compiler, um, and it'll automatically include all the directories and the linker files, and uh, generate the uh, executable name that we wanted that we had specified in cmakelist.txt. So I'll run make, this will compile the code, and um, all that was successful. And when we run the code, we'll first we'll look and make sure that it generated it. So see I have a green hello world in there. It's gonna, um, the Raspbian operating system is gonna color executable files as green. So it doesn't have a file extension to it. Um, Linux doesn't put an exe on a file the way that Windows would put one or would put a tag on an executable file, but it colors it green, which tells me that that's a uh, executable. So if I want to run it, uh, I have to give the path to the file. Now I could again give the long path to the file, which would be um, tilde slash CSE twenty one hundred slash hello world um, slash hello world like this. I could run the hello world application by entering in this string. Or for shorthand, I can use our dot operator again. I can say the current directory I'm located in, which is dot, give it the slash, and then hello world, and then I can run my code. So I'll run this, and it prints hello world, and we were successful. And finally, if we want to gracefully shut down the Raspberry Pi without just pulling the plug on it, that'll work too, uh, but it's not really the best thing to do. We can do sudo shutdown now, and then that will invoke the uh, shutdown process. So we'll give our board um, a few seconds, maybe 10, 20, 30 seconds to shut down, and then we can pull the power plug on it.